Welcome, all of you, uh, to our next Tiger Talk uh, session, where we're going from arts to engineering. It's a closer look at the majors and programs at Morehouse College. So welcome, all of you, to this amazing uh, webinar that we have here today. All right, so as you know, if you don't know, I'm Michael Gum, Director of Admissions of Morehouse College. And as all alumnus would say, proud member of, and I'm a proud member of the class of 2010. We are so fortunate to have one of the most esteemed professors at the college who also is an amazing uh, member of this illustrious institution and alumni group of uh, Professor Ilya Davis. And I'll let him introduce himself at this point. Good evening. Thank you very much. It is my honor to be here this evening. Hopefully we can get deep down into the conversation to etch out something of a way of being in the world. So I am Ilya Davis, Director of Freshman and Seniors Academic Success and Professor in Philosophy Department. I'm a 1989 graduate of Morehouse College. Right. And so Professor Davis is, is phenomenal. Um, and we're going to go into Morehouse first, and then we're going to go right into selecting a major and all the talking points from there. So to get started, a little bit about this amazing institution known as Morehouse College. For over 150 years, Morehouse has been in existence with the, dis with the focus to educate black men or men of color to become teachers, leaders, preachers. And from there, we would grow and be at an array of an opportunity to select students from an, a various sort of majors that would then lead lives of leadership and service. So it's about being an educating, uh, educating future youth leaders and youth, while also uh, putting them out into the world to be change agents and leaders. And we do this at this institution and have been doing it for over 150 years. With that focus of educating preachers and teachers, uh, Morehouse now uh, has grown into an institution that prides itself on leadership and excellence. So coming into this institution, you're not just joining a group of about 17,000 plus alumni that are just doing amazing things. You're also joining uh, for yourself the opportunity to, to understand you while you're also understanding the world around you. And we believe we do that better than any other place across the globe. So the first thing we're going to talk about is what is a liberal arts education? And the one thing that Professor Davis is going to harp in, and I want you all to take notes to really understand what does this mean, right? Because when we talk about a liberal arts ed education, we're talking about having the range of disciplines that allows the individual to see things and to witness things as a global citizen and a problem solve. So when you talk about education, when you talk about Morehouse, there's a way in which you are finding yourself and then finding yourself then selecting and choosing an, an education that's going to be kind of geared towards uh, understanding discipline and understanding focuses while modeling different philosophical uh, genres and perspectives that gives you a holistic kind of viewpoint. And so liberal arts is focused on that. You'll see there the belief, not only are there many ways of viewing the world, but that what? But that each lens is worthy of consideration. And this is where it gets really interesting. So here, and you're going to hear Professor Davis harp on this, it's not just about educating your mind to go into a field. It's about understanding what does it mean to be a critical thinker? What does it mean to really take on logic and to then formulate different perspectives, to understanding your mind, how you see your discipline, but how you see yourself within that discipline, that we're going to give you a certain type of problem solving, of critical analysis, of certain type of oral communication skills as a part of the curriculum at Morehouse College. So, Professor Davis, very, very interesting question. What does a liberal arts education mean to you and at Morehouse College? Great question, Michael. So, let's look at the end and end result. 
And the end result of a liberal arts education is someone who takes seriously what it means to be human and what it means to engage in social, social engagement with others. That's the product. And the product isn't determinate in the way that people might think. And what I mean by that is it's not reducible to employment. It has more to do with cultivating a certain way of being in the world that, as Michael has already articulated, includes, not limited to, one's critical gaze on and critical evaluation of what it means to be a human being. And what it means to be a human being has to include your relationship with others, what we call an intersubjective relationship. How is it that you view yourself and others in the world within a particular social arrangement that maximizes the humanity, the respect, the dignity, and love and care for all humanity. Well, that's difficult. Now let's go back to the liberal arts education. How does it afford you this, this view of the world? Well, we read, we engage, we investigate. We try to figure out how it is that the human being has, hopefully, progressed to the stage which we find ourselves. Maybe we've digressed, but the only way you're going to know this is reading, particularly the history of humanity, the history of ideas, how is it that we've come to be arranged in what we call a democratic structure, living in a republic, free ideas exchanged? And we know all oh too well about countries and, and environments where these possibilities aren't celebrated. They are truncated by limited views of what it means to be a human being. And so liberalized education here in Morehouse is going to request that you take a plethora of courses that you may not initially be interested in. Irrespective of your major, you're going to be requested, and I would even go so far as to say required, to cultivate an understanding of things such as sociology, philosophy, religion, political science, physics, mathematics, chemistry, biology. Why? Because all of these areas, these disciplines, have something to say about the type of being, the type of thing you are. Because we are animals, but what we appreciate as a human animal is the ability to live counter to certain natural predispositions. And so what we want to do is cultivate within every student this idea of wanting to be a better human being, never settling for where you are located in the world presently, but always looking forward to the possibility of improvement, never perfection, but always improvement. So the liberal arts education is going to have you read Shakespeare. It's going to have you read Newton. Is going to have you read Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Why? Of course, these individuals are dead now, but their ideas live on in the practices of our various societies. And you need to be informed in this regard. How best to arrange ourselves again to maximize who we are and who we could be as human beings. Man, I, I, I love that. I love that. And, that, you know, we talk about uh, the rational rationalization of, of the reason, the ability to reason as human beings is giving us this idea. And that goes back to that critical thinking you're talking about as it relates to liberal arts education. Um, very simple, right? Uh, what are the various majors or approaches and their fundamental differences? I know that's a, a big thing for you. And that's a big thing for you. You go into that? Yes, it is. So liberal arts education will usually... It's not reducible to, but usually be segregated based on the natural sciences. Sometimes I think we will call them computational sciences included. And then we will have the humanities and social sciences. So the natural sciences are usually empirically based. That means that through various forms of observation and the analysis of observed phenomena, one begins to provide descriptions of the way the natural world functions. Now, it's not reducible to the natural world because mathematics is found there, and that's more abst I mean, abstract. And you know, within philosophical parlance, we talk about something known as realist view and an anti-realist view. The realist view says that the world is the way it is irrespective of people thinking it. So some philosophers have believed that things only exist to the degree to which you think of them. Well, the natural sciences pushes back against that idea. And it wants to represent that the things in our world, the things in the multiverse, if you will, do not require our existence. In as much as we would like to believe that the world needs us, it doesn't need us. We are our shepherds, if you will. Our responsibility is to do good for and to the things that we've been blessed with. 
And so you come to know this in the study of biology, chemistry, physics, as I said, even engineering and mathematics. They are very much interested in quantifiable information. That is, how is it that you measure the physical world? For example, I often ask students, what, is, what do you take geometry to do? And they sit there in a quadrant. I don't know. Geometry in the most beautiful sense is the philosophy of space. How is space to be organized and parceled and, and vetted? It's a beautiful idea. Now, sadly, they didn't teach me this in high school, so geometry wasn't one of my favorite courses because of that. But once you understand that everything that we consider to be of the material world has some configuration in space and that there's a wonder to be found there. So the natural sciences constantly forges through and tries to unveil and disclose the beauty of the physical material world from trees and elephants down to microorganisms. This is the most beautiful thing. Now, in the social sciences, what they're going to do is try to incorporate aspects of the quantified fields, as I said, physics and mathematics and so forth, and use those to discern what it is about being a human within social institutions and how human beings interact with each other socially. Now, it's a beautiful way of approaching life because what you're saying is there's a value to be found in trying to give an account of what's possible. You don't assume that the data informs you about what will happen in the future. You're trying to account for what has transpired such that it becomes a lesson. One learns to do the experiences through sociology, psychology, economics. These are areas in the social sciences, and they're constantly trying to unveil what it is to be human being. But what you're now doing is the qualitative, that is an evaluative interpretation, and at the same time, a quantitative evaluation and bring those together, which leads us to the humanities. The humanities are music, religion, philosophy, history, art. These beautiful subjects express and celebrate human creativity in ways that are different than the other disciplines. Because what they're trying to say is we've not rested on the laurels of being human. They're constantly forcing you to be creative, constructive. So in art, which includes everything from you know, music to paintings. And what we're saying is there's something about being human, unlike other animals, because we know chimpanzees have something we might want to call culture, if you will, or civilization or hierarchical structures. But for some interesting reason, they don't do what we do with our cultural expressions. And these cultural expressions represent the creation of art, the creation of music. And from what we know, other animal groups don't do this. And so in the humanities, you're always trying to ask yourself, what does it mean to be in a world with others? So one of the famous quotes, I think Jean-Paul Sartre, we read to know that we're not alone. This is what happens in the humanities. You're constantly trying to figure out, are there other ways, other imaginative ways of being a human that are represented in the lived experience of other people, particularly here in Morehouse, how black people get old, have gotten old, continue to move through notions of tragedy and trauma even though the assumption would be that we should have lost, we continue to win through cultural expression and creation. And that's what the humanities offers. I love that. I love that. Um, man, you said a, you said a, a lot right there. The uh, understanding of culture and how liberal arts is connected to then the four disciplines, right? Uh, we have the discipline of STEMs or science, technology, engineering, mathematics, right? The humanities and social science division, right? The division continuing education, right? And then last but not least, uh, the division of business and how all of those are intertwined. You said something about how it's rooted in sort of the humanities or social sciences. And so it's really, which one comes first in your, in your, uh, in your tech? <laughs> well, I um, wouldn't even say it's a matter of first. So the Segregation of disciplines is relatively new. You would refer to Michelangelo as a scientist. He did science. He also did art. He also did architecture. So the, the, the modern university created disciplines, and you could even argue for personal reasons. Um, individuals got employment. I mean, you gained employment by being in a department. 
And it's much more difficult to educate someone more broadly. I mean, again, this is the reason why we have liberalized education, because there is a fundamental appreciation for diverse learning across these areas. But in the same instance, the, the, modern, the modern university bought into the idea of disciplinary lines, if you will. So in the 19th century, late 19th century, majors developed, because prior to that, you didn't even have majors. People just took a series of courses, usually 100 level courses, and graduated. But what they discovered, Brother Mike, is that these individuals fail to have some concentrated understanding of a phenomenon, whether that is social, political, economic, religious, what have you. They just didn't have enough in those areas because no one expects a college student to graduate as an expert, but they should have a facility with a discipline such that they can account for its historical development and some of the ideas. So mm -hmm. when you start talking about what's first, you have to give a more com it has to be a more complex representation because it's relatively recent. I mean, even if you consider the, the father of Western modern philosophy, Rene Descartes, of course he did philosophy, but also he along with Gottfried Leibniz developed analytic geometry. So it wasn't a limit for them. It was an intellectual pursuit. And what was the pursuit? And I know I keep harping on this. What am I? What type of thing am I? And is my investigation going to disclose possibilities that are not prima facie presented, right? What would it mean for me to delve into this to try to extract something more about being you? Yeah, 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 no, that's good. That's good. I love that. So now to my next question, because uh, you, you, you're harping right into these, these structures. How does humanities, social sciences, right? and natural sciences affect students' outcome, in your opinion? Well, I will tell you or repeat what I often tell students. Interestingly enough, and I don't blame students for it because this is more of an American educational structure that has overwhelmed them, and that is they reduce education to mere employment. Of course, we need to be employed, but to reduce it to employment without all the other extraneous variables that go into what it means to be human, I think is reductions. So to choose a major, and I think this question is going to come up later anyway, what you're asking of yourself is to cultivate a certain sensibility, intellectual sensibility to cover you in case things change. That's just my own take on it, right? Because if I were parochial and said, well, I'm just going to major in X because I want the job Y. But then, as we all know, things change. And if I decide that there's more or something else that I want, am I able to pivot? So if I choose to major in something, it should provide me with the resources to be more malleable and to put myself in diverse positions and scenarios. Now, it is very important to realize that these different disciplines also stimulate different neural networks and the synapses within the brain to study analytic which is mathematical philosophy as well, it's going to force stimulation in areas of the brain that you may not have stimulated if you reduce your learning to one particular area. So again, the liberalized education is going to say, we're going to try left, right brain, whatever, front lobe, anything we can. We're going to try to stimulate because at the end of the day, you need to be prepared for whatever is out there. And with that social science, and that humanities, along with the natural sciences, is going to do, it's going to afford you with the breadth of not just employment, but the ability to shift in light of the changing world. I mean, now people are doing artificial intelligence. Everybody, philosophy has been doing artificial intelligence for over 70 years, for over 70 years, discussing this. And now other disciplines are now talking about it. Computer science, closely related to philosophy as well, and philosophy to computer science and mathematics. These things are interconnected in ways that we've done a disservice by telling someone learn a particular discipline in isolation from. So when you engage in these disciplines, as you had listed here, you try to equip yourself and embolden a certain understanding of the diversity of what it means to be in the so-called market to produce the best outcomes for, for human existence. So if I'm going to Wall Street, I should go to Wall Street with a moral compass. Well, where would that come from? Religion, philosophy. And I should also come understanding how institutions come to bear on the individual lives of the marginalized and those who suffer. Sociology, psychology. You understand? So now, coming from a liberalized education, 
I'm not an expert in these fields, but I am equipped with certain fundamental knowledge about what these institutions do to forge realities for so many people, and particularly the marginalized. It is our responsibility at Morehouse. It's incumbent upon us to do the work that other people can't be afforded because of their daily living. I always tell students, your job is to learn as much as you can because if you become the only person in the world to educate the world, how ignorant will the world be? Your job is to make sure you learn and learn and learn. Life learners, I know, is one of the terms we use. But this is only going to happen and be productive when you understand it's not the myopic approach. It's the more diverse, complex networks of learning that are necessary. No, exactly. Um, you said you said something that really, really keyed in right there. And it was on that social sciences, humanities, you know, sort of those four divisions. And then I think the key here is out of those four, you talked about what does it mean to be human? Like we hear this, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be human? I'll, you go into that because I think we, we consider ourselves rational beings, right? Which we have the ability to think. <laughs> and I know where you're going with this. Um, but at the same time, you know, when I select a major, when I'm thinking about a major, how does that part of, you know, I have an idea of what I want to go into, but where do I pull that, right? Because you talked about, you know, music and the arts and, and you know, those aspects. Where, where do I select it? You know, which one do I choose? Yeah, and well, so sort of like you did, Brother Michael, your heart must be taken seriously. It's to thine own self, as Billy Shakespeare tells us, you must be true. There is no one major to get you to the end. Usually these ends are very limited as well because the ends that most students talk about are five, 10 year jobs, you know, employment. I'll work here for a while then. So what do you have to say to yourself? What animates me? What makes me come alive as we hear Oprah and others say? What, what makes you come alive? Well, that's, that's serious. That's serious business because what you're saying is, am I gonna wake up in the morning wanting to do it? Am I going to go to bed at night, not begrudging the extra work, but celebrating the fact that I get to learn more about this thing? Now, even if you were to look at the stats, you do not need to major in biology to go to medical school. What they would like is that you choose something that you care enough about to do well. They want you to do as well as you can. Now, the prerequisites of medical school can be discerned from any medical school's website. They're usually well, about five classes organic chemistry, physics, mathematics, and biology to have to be the last one. But you got to, you, you fundamentally take those courses, but on top of your desire to be an art history major, for example. And I hate when people, parents say, well, what are you going to do with that? Anything he wants, because we're trying to develop thinkers, people who know how to engage in analytic analysis, investigation into phenomena. And the phenomena could be physical or intellectual or both, combination of the two. So what we're trying to say is, what do I need to get to where I want to go? Well, that has to be tempered by the fact that the reality says you don't know where you're going. So until you begin taking courses, and that's what we encourage at Morehouse, take the general ed. You have no idea that you were going to love sociality. You had no idea that you might have a proclivity to physics. And don't reduce it to what you did in high school. This isn't the same anymore. And the last bit of advice is never reduce the quality of a discipline to its instructor. A lot of students I get will say, well, I hate such and such class. And my question is, what about the teacher? Do you find the teacher to be of interest? Well, no, I said, no, no, be careful. Now it goes both ways. Some students get excited about a major because the teacher is good. I said, do not engage in a cult of personality. All the rest of the teachers you may have for the rest of your life in this discipline may not be that good. So what does that mean? You must now decide to investigate things you're interested in. And the interest is not going to be one-to-one -one all, the, all the time. So if I love doing something, it may not be a major, but what your job is to approximate closeness to that area. So we get a lot of students who want to do things that may not have a major at this school, maybe in no college, right? So your job is how close can you get? So we don't have a cognitive science program, but you can do philosophy and computer science, right? We don't have 
something that might be, well, we do have some neuro work. You could do neuroscience over at Moorhouse School of Medicine under the certain vetting process of the biology department. But it's not a crisp and clean part of our discipline here. So you, again, you do psychology, you do philosophy, you do computer science. My point being, you can combine disciplines to get as close as you can to what you believe you would like to do or pursue in the future. It's very important because I tell students all the time, if you've chosen a major because of employment, that's all you'll ever do. You want to make sure that you are true to yourself. Law school doesn't require a specific major either. You can major in mathematics. Even if you were to look, and I hate to say this, but you look at the standardized test scores of law school, medical school, it's going to be physical science, philosophy, mathematics, engineering, physics. They score higher on the standardized test. And you have to ask, why is that the case? It's a certain formidable approach to learning. Critical analysis, investigated, um, writing, 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 writing. These areas of, of, of learning are extremely important to putting you in a situation where when you're ready to finally decide what you're going to do for life, that you will be more equipped for it. Love it. Um, to my next question, for my next one, uh, Professor Davis, uh, we'll see it on the screen here. Um, what are the different types, right? What are the different types of teaching and learning methodologies used from your own personal perspective to also what's taught at Morehouse? Well, this might be my shortest answer, and that is lectures, uh, seminar structures. For me, it's normally topic-based and uh, maybe it's Socratic, maybe it's not so much Socratic. That is, I really don't ask students questions, but I will make statements and I, re I request that they analyze my statements and find the flaws, um, not just logical flaws, but social flaws. That is, what, a, what is an individual allowed to say and not assume scrutiny is going to follow? And that happens a lot in the social sciences and the humanities because we make room for the imagination in ways that other disciplines don't. Not that mathematics and physics aren't creative. It's just as a matter of course, the social sciences and the humanities leave more room. And so I'm trying to make sure that our students leave Morehouse with a critical gaze on their own ideas, their presuppositions that have led them here. But the hope is that they can dispel many of the myths that they have brought about the world that they lived in. The world is very small for many high school students. We're trying to get that to expand exponentially by the time they graduate. So one must always focus on how is it that I'm going to maximize, I'm going to undergird what I learned in my particular discipline, and how does it translate to the world? Because again, our responsibility is for the other as well. We don't want to leave that out. So we do the lectures, we do the seminars, um, we do the one-on-ones. There's something special. Topics is an, an area that we provide in all disciplines that allow for teachers to be more creative, that they can allow themselves to teach something that may not be on the books, but students might be interested in. So a student can come to a professor and say, listen, I want to do a, a reading of the history of phenomenology and psychoanalysis. And then is not on the books. We'll say, Professor Gum is willing to read with me. So the student makes a reading list, a, a, an annotated bibliography, and you evaluate it, make sure that the fundamental text that you believe to be um, necessary for them to read is on there. And then you all meet once a week, maybe for two hours um, every week to discuss. And then the student will eventually write one or two essays, about 15, 25 pages. Why is that important? Because we don't want to limit what your student will learn based on the curriculum as it is. The curriculum is open to the degree to which that type of experience can be had. And the last part, as you know, Brother Michael, the greatest learning may be between the brothers at Morehouse. They learn in the front of buildings, beside buildings, in their dorms. And I think that's when they get to challenge one another on what has transpired. You know, they may have taken Brother Gum's intro class to whatever. They take somebody else's class. Now they want to see, does this rubber hit the road? Does it make sense? And am I able to provide a coherent explanation of what I have learned such that I can teach it and have it critiqued by my friends and that I can move forward. That's it. <laughs> That's it right there. 
Um, you know, I think about uh, Brown Street conversation, right? And a lot of your class structure, and I was very, I, let me just say, I, I brag on Professor Davis because a lot of my tutelage and understanding started with this brother right here, this young brother right here, by the way. Uh, when I think about Brown Street and I think about our conversations, um, that's one of the beauties of Morehouse. You can engage quickly. Uh, what is your uh, take, right, uh, as it relates to being confined in the classroom? And how you how do you interpret, right? Because I remember being in class and I remember your biggest thing was if you didn't read, you're not prepared. Right. Uh, so what is the reading like? And then how does those conversations and thinking of Crown Forum and all these other sessions that are encouraged at Morehouse? How does that kind of gamanize the idea of education as we begin to really talk about it in and out of the classroom? Right. I'll begin with the Crown Forum idea. So Crown Forum is a a truncated version of what used to happen in Morehouse. At Morehouse, they used to have chapel service every day. And the president would address all the students every day. That's amazing. And so it was abbreviated. As I said, it was truncated. And now every Thursday, freshmen, sophomores, and juniors must attend Crown Forum. Crown Forum becomes that extra, if not meta, uh, educational structure, wherein you now hear the ideas that have been taught in class, rehearsed in public by visitors and by professors here at the school. And so students who have paid attention now begin to see what we've been offering them as, again, rehearsed in front of them. So you will hear a lecture. I just recently had um, a professor come and speak to students, and it was a book that recently was published by him. And it wasn't about agreement, but it was their ability to avail themselves of their education as they interpreted what they heard. So every Thursday, this is what happens. Now, freshmen meet with me every Tuesday in freshman orientation. Again, this was something that the president of the Morehouse used to do years ago, 70, 80, 90 years ago. They would meet with them. What is the value of it? Well, at bottom, encouragement, because it's not easy. And one begins to question oneself. Do I have what it takes? Yes, you do. So we serve as a sort of coach slash cheerleader trying to motivate them. You can do this. I know you're around some of the most brilliant people you've ever met in your life, but don't let that dissuade you from promoting the best of who you are. And so we have this extra meta, as I said, educational structures, freshman orientation on Tuesdays for all first year students, and then Crown Forum on Thursdays for freshmen, sophomores, and juniors. Now, now you're talking about an education that expands beyond the classroom because once they come out of that service, once they come out of the classroom, again, they meet each other on Brown Street. Brown Street is this main uh, vein that goes through Morehouse. It used to be a public street, but Morehouse built around this public street, and the name is Brown Street. And what students have opportunity there is to engage each other, to ask questions. What was that class like? What's the professor up to? What did they talk about? Have you learned anything new? Do you think you'll be able to do this in the future? Where are you going to graduate school? Have you applied to graduate school? I mean, have you applied for the Rhodes Scholarship? Have you applied for the Marshall Scholarship? Everything imaginable is discussed there and vetted. One of the beautiful things about Morehouse is we don't let you get away with what you probably would get away with other schools. And people come in, it's like, oh my God, you all really go for each other. No, we love each other. That's why we're going to push each other. We're going to fight each other. And I don't do the metaphor, iron doesn't sharpen iron for me. Love creates more love. And I'm going to be as honest as I can about ideas that don't go anywhere. If your idea is stillborn, we're going to say it. Do it again. Try it again. It's not good enough. What, what do I mean by not good enough? We're talking about liberation pedagogy, liberative. Everything from Paulo Freire to Jonathan Kozel. We want the student to know that learning never ends. Well, that's too much learning. There is not too much learning. Too many people are suffering for us to assume that we can take time away from engaging each other critically and evaluatively. Let's go. So uh, I think this is one of our final questions right here, right? Uh, and, and as we move to this one, and then we want to open up this chat after this, y'all. We want to hear from you, okay? I have tons of questions, but I've been asking questions from day one because we never stop learning, uh, according to Professor Davis. Uh, what should students focus on when considering their major? And I know you, you harped on that. You talked about that. But, hey, I'm trying to select a major. What should I focus on? First thing, again, 
back to the heart. What do you care about? So I always tell students, write your own list. What do you really care about? I mean, if it's anything from anime, if it's physical particles, I mean, write down what do I care about? What, what do you want to do with what you care about? Because again, if you aren't animated, it turns into drudgery. It turns into work. Your experience in college should be a love affair. And if you're not loving it, trust me, it's just work. So ask yourself, understanding that you very well may change. I think a statistic showed that people between 30 and 40 change jobs at least five times and not jobs in the same discipline, you know, different areas of interest. Partly because they didn't vet when they were students. They didn't critically evaluate who they were and what suits them as the type of person they are becoming. So you should put yourself in a situation where you learn broadly, but also methodologically. As I said, if you are a quantitative person, you should continue doing the quantitative work. I tell students, if you learn languages and you learn languages relatively easily, do it. My niece um, majored at Spelman in Spanish. She's now a physician. Because she loves Spanish, she did very, very well and took the requisite courses and on to medical school. Same thing in Morehouse, one of our best students in philosophy. He majors in philosophy in Morehouse. Now he's at the University of Michigan Medical School. What's important here is that they decided to do something that animated them. So as you were deciding on majors, the first thing is that the general education curriculum help guide you. Take the courses your first year. Many students come in, decide they're going to major in something, and because they falsely assume there's only one route, they will not change. They're not even open to, open to hearing alternatives. So be open. Your responsibility coming to college and more specifically to Morehouse is a certain openness about your learning. You should not believe the same thing now as you did in the eighth and ninth grade. And you must be open to the possibility of recalibrating, refashioning what you understand to be truth and falsity based on what you're learning. So there should be something from science that's going to encourage you to think differently about what you want to do in the future. Taking a course in physical science, taking a course in sociology, all of these diverse courses should help you. That's why we're giving them to you. So your responsibility to yourself is sit down. What type of person am I? And again, you're not an expert. But you're going to have to say to yourself, do I love doing this? Do I love doing that? Do I like travel? All those things. What types of things? I really am good at art. If you're good, do you care about it? Do it. Make sure that you understand if you care about it, you will do well. And graduate schools, professional schools would prefer you do something showing your creativity, your critical evaluation skills, and you care about it. Love it. Love it. Now we're going to jump into this Q&A section. Uh, please put your uh, questions in, in, in the chat. It's not every day you get a professor uh, that is engaged as, as Professor Davis is, as it relates to understanding these concepts, really going into what is liberal arts education. And so, uh, you know, at this time, we want to ask, uh, ask Professor Davis some questions. So the first question we have for you, sir, is, what is the balance of reading in class, community work, global, et cetera, and a liberal arts Morehouse education? It's a continuum. There's not even separate things. All of those happen in one fell swoop. I, I was fortunate enough to take a group of students. Um, one spring break, we went to London, rode the train to Paris, and then flew over to Rome. What were we doing? We were doing an analysis, a psychological evaluation of race. What does race look like, even though it was a short period of time, but we wanted to give students a broader vision of how the world responds to the concept of race. And it was a beautiful trip. So what we take with us is the learning that students have engaged in up to that point and allow them to critically evaluate the experiences that we were having. And without going into it, they had experiences. Oh, we had some heated experiences with the indigenous people of these areas. And it was informative. And we had students constantly writing about it, writing reflections and journaling every day, because it's not about us telling students. We're open to students teaching us. Every time I engage a student, I expect to learn something from him. And I expect the reciprocity to be fundamental to the Morehouse experience. So the global experiences, um, the community is always a fundamental aspect. I always ask students, 
if I were to let you out of this class, could you explain what we did theoretically to my relatives? Were you, are you able? One of, one of the most difficult questions my mother asked me, I remember when my mother didn't finish high school and I came in the house. She said, sit down. What you learn? Huh? Like generally? And that's the most profound question I ever had because her point was, you're in school. What did you learn? Because she's asking a practical question. That is, does this, does this education you claim to be getting have a place in my world? And so I try to encourage all students to realize that, yeah, of course, maybe, you know, quantum physics might not have a direct impact, but there's something indirect you can give an account of. Maybe the principle of uncertainty. Maybe that can, that, that can inform somebody in your family about the failure to always seek certainty when life is a little more ambiguous than what we take it to be. So there's always a way to do this, always to incorporate what you learn here at Morehouse, how it translates across borders, and how it's communicated to the people in our community. Love that. I love that. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's a big one, right? And I love that your mother asked you that question because we don't think about the simplicity of questions as it relates to that, right? Um, but it's, it's, it's more profound than what we think. Uh, we got one uh, that says, how can I learn about the engineering dual degree program? Do the partner schools have the same view on learning and not to study for the end goal of a particular job? I love that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that, that's a nuts and bolts question in, right? So yeah, I like I like it. Well, brother Mike, you could probably give a better answer than I can. So Dr. Red, who's chair of the physics department, is now uh, servicing interest in dual degree. Uh, whether or not other institutions, I mean, I'm sure I trust these schools everywhere from University of Michigan to Rensselaer and other schools that we have partnerships with. See, one thing you should be certain of, if you do right by Morehouse, Morehouse will do right by you. That is, you'll be prepared to go anywhere. I normally don't mention this, and Mike knows it, but as an example. So when I left Morehouse, I went to graduate school at Harvard, and then I went to graduate school at the University of Chicago. One of, if not the greatest gift, was my Morehouse experience. Because I was ready. Professors told me, you're ready. We've given you as much as we could in the period of time you've been here. So when I went to these institutions, my response to that stimulus in those environments was very different than a lot of other black folk. Those of us from Morehouse would hang out together and people knew we were different. They would often say, here come the Morehouse guys. That's right. We're on our way because we walk differently. We talk differently. And more importantly, it was a, being self-assured about when we put it into work, we had a right to walk the way we did. It wasn't arrogance in the way that it would undermine our work and diligence. It was more a matter of, I feel good about what I've done, right? And that I'm going to celebrate. I like the fact that Deion Sanders now is trying to explain to people. He said, my two fathers, my stepfather and my natural born father were never in my games and my mother was always working. So I had to learn to cheer for myself. Yes, sir. I applaud that because sometimes that's all the acknowledgement you'll get. So you got to keep yourself motivated. You don't want to lose yourself questioning yourself. You want to build yourself by being self-assured. So I don't know about the other schools, but I do know Morehouse will make you ready. That's and that's, um, you know, I, I love that because, again, that subject matter of liberal arts. And when we start talking about, you know, what you want to choose, I hope you're thinking about some of these these major conceptualizations of what does it mean to be a human being? You know, that tell us. Right. Your volume went out. It came back and then went out again. And now you're frozen if you can hear me. Still can't hear. I, I'm hoping it's not just me that can't hear. Can you hear me, Michael? You hear me? I hear, yep, I can hear you well. All right, now you're back. Okay. I'm back. Okay. So it was me. I apologize. I was going to get into this dual degree because someone asked the question, like, what is it? Right. Um, so what's amazing about Morehouse. Right. And this is the formal answer. So I'm giving you what, what we say, uh, which is true. Uh, the dual degree engineering program, you do three years at Morehouse and then two years at an engineering school of their choice out of 13 choices. So you have uh, Dartmouth, MIT, Georgia Tech. Um, you know, Professor Davis mentioned um, RPI, Richler Polytechnical Institute in New York. 
There's several institutions we have this connection with, but the idea, right, is that you'll graduate with two degrees in five years. Very, very awesome program. What I love is that what Professor uh, Davis is referring to is that you're going to have a requirement of having philosophy, music, English, history, sociology as a part of the curriculum that gets you to your core and your major major functionality in, to, in order to graduate. So I just want to make sure everyone's clear simply that uh, that is a part of the liberal arts education, the general education concept that you have to have a little bit of everything uh, where we're creating a well-rounded experience and a well-rounded individual, as Professor Davis has mentioned. I want to go into this business question. Are there any business dual degree programs? And that's a, that's, a, uh, so I, you know, we mentioned that business is, you know, we're a top feeder school for graduate schools. We talk about this idea of business as a, the fortune 500 companies come to Morehouse to recruit, uh, professor Davis from your lens are there partnerships, right? Uh, and I look at that because, you know, you got the business cats that come over and take philosophy. What is your, what is your take? Take on those guys, right? Woo, you really got me on this one. Well, let's look at it this way. What is your aspiration? What is your your sort of midterm game? Because it's not an end game. What's your midterm game? To produce the best business mind, what are the requisite methods, techniques that you need to cultivate? So I'll use by analogy. One of my schoolmates, uh, Damon Phillips, is a professor of business at Wharton School of Business, University of Pennsylvania. Before that, he was a professor of business at the University of Chicago. He left University of Chicago, went to Columbia University, and now he's at UPenn and Wharton School. Damon was a physics major at Morehouse. He graduated Phi Beta Kappa and then went on to MIT and did a master's in physics. Then he went to Stanford and did a master's in sociology. Then he got a PhD from Stanford in strategies, and he's been teaching business for 25 years. He understood his, his trajectory a little differently than many people. Uh, could he work on Wall Street? Please. Yesterday, Any, anything he wants. And I use him as an example to say there is no singular route to what you project to be your future in whatever industry. I just think that some majors might be more suited to develop skills that you would like to have translate into the market, if you will. So be a physics major if you do physics, be a math major. If you want to do finance, if you want to do accounting, fine. But I don't want you to feel locked in such that your assumption is it's only one route. There are multiple routes that lead you to those environments. And so when you start talking about dual enrollment program that I guess the question was, it doesn't need to be dual if you do right by yourself and learn the methods and techniques of these different disciplines. Think about it this way. If you study marketing, do you realize you're doing second order sociology and psychology? You cannot do marketing without studying psychology and sociology. So our job is not to tell you what to major in. It's more a matter of to put you in an environment that's conducive to you discerning what best sets you in the best position to do well. So take classes, learn something you didn't know before, then make the decision. I don't want you to reduce it to, well, I want to, students love to say this, I want to own my own business. That has nothing to do with a particular major. That doesn't. And, and most people who have private business will tell you, trust me, it was grit, it was willpower, it was the ability to, to be, you know, uh, malleable, to change on a dime. I mean, these are the fundamental qualities you need. Well, how do you strengthen these things? What is your analytic skills? Or did you do enough math? Did you do enough work that's going to provide you with insights into human behavior such that if you want to market your own business, you understand human psychology? What about cognitive psychology? I mean, the thing is, there's so many ways to achieve these things you aspire to such that be open to the possibility of doing something you never imagined through the liberal arts education. Our general education is going to provide you with these opportunities. So there is no single way to do this. Be open. But again, don't find something just because you think is going to get you somewhere 
Get yourself somewhere where you love and care about the discipline. I love that. I love that. You know, and this goes into that next question. How does a liberal arts college education differ from any other type of college education when both allow a major to focus on in order to position self to future career opportunities? Yeah. Well, I'll do it by analogy, and I hate to do this. So um, Morehouse College, being a liberal arts college, is distinguished from usually technical colleges that focus on technical things, engineering, physics, mathematics. Doesn't mean they don't do some of the courses we have. Their fundamental thrust is in the sciences. So for example, MIT is going to have a political science department, a philosophy department, but their fundamental aspiration is to be the school of engineering, right? mathematics, physics, and so forth. And so at Morehouse, we spend more time in trying to cover breadth and depth where their breadth isn't as broad as Morehouse, both going equally deep, but it's this that matters at a liberal arts college. So music, as Brother Mike said, you're going to do music, you're going to do history, you're going to do English, you're going to do religion and philosophy and so forth, where it may not be, it's usually not a requirement at technical institutions. So technical schools, MIT, Caltech, um, Virginia Tech. Now, also, we're different than schools that might, well, I'm trying to think of a college that I can use as an example, schools that don't even offer philosophy. God knows what kind of place to see though, right? Because I always tell students, a PhD is a doctorate of philosophy. Anybody with a PhD, that means they got a doctorate of philosophy in the particular discipline. It's extremely important. And so what that means is you've made a concerted effort to learn something theoretical and conceptual about the thing you're doing such that it's not reducible to application. You're also giving an account of the existence and the nature of the thing. So to have a PhD in history, a PhD in finance, you're not just doing the nuts and bolts. You're trying to say finance by its very nature purports to do X, Y, and Z. And so on our way there through these courses, you will one day get to where I am as a professor and you will say, now I understand the nature of the beast. This is what it fundamentally exists. For example, students don't even realize money doesn't even exist in the material world. They think that the paper that they get is money. None of your parents bought a house with dollars. It was a concept that was exchanged. Debt is what we use. And so when we have these conversations, I want my students who are interested in the business world to understand this is what makes the so-called business world go around. Not the stuff that people put up their ears like telephones and videos. No. At any given moment, when somebody says that's worthless, it's worthless. It's the concept of money that matters more than these very limited notions of, well, I want a lot of that. No, that's not the way it goes. Right? And that's just an example of how you're going to focus your attention on big picture and not the simple picture. No, no, that's, and that's that broadness, right? And then who you are as a person, how that comes out in terms of selection, right? And that's that's so important because I, I hope everybody understands she's talking about like identity and knowing yourself and then you knowing yourself, then choosing your major, how that aligns to then being able to say, this is the best opportunity, schooling, right? Whether you're going to go pursue a higher level of a degree after your Bachelor of Arts or Bachelor of Science degree, Make sure that all that's linear to what it is that you are going to do well in and what you have a desire for, right? So all of that has to be in alignment and and there's no one path towards that. Um, and I hope that 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 message is being being conveyed uh, very, very well, Doc. Um, does the music curriculum cover digital music production? Yes, you know that. We have two Grammy Award winning brothers at Morehouse who teach music production. They teach a class under that title. And depending on your level, they invite select students to learn the entire music industry throughout the year. So when you come to school here, we'll introduce you. We can't share all of our little secrets online right now, right? But the point is these two gentlemen, one of whom is Kennard Garrett, um, brilliant young man who attended Morehouse, as I said, Grammy Award winner, uh, I think he won his most recent Grammy for writing a song for the musical artist Sting. I know you all probably wouldn't know who Sting is, but look up Sting. But the production is here. 
So I tell students and the opportunities are always present. They they fundamentally are open brothers. They're approachable brothers. I think they do a wonderful job of, of mentoring and supporting the students in Morehouse in their musical aspirations, whether that's production or actual performance. They're here for them. They teach them the recording, not just recording industry. They teach you actually how to do the production. Yeah. 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 You know, I think about uh, PJ Morton, right? Who's an, uh, an amazing artist, right? Um, has great music and please go check out his music. He's a Morehouse alum. And I think about just our, our ability to engage with those types of individuals as they look at Morehouse, right? We don't really focus on the arts per se, and we don't really, I guess, talk about it as much as we should. Our cinema, television, emerging media studies program or our visual arts program, or our art curator program, right? Um, so I have this question, does the visual arts curriculum cover or come close to covering any digital art, such as animation or just drawing and paintings? And I mean, there's some there's some really cool things that we're doing that I know you can harp on as, as uh, in the field of humanities, as you were mentioning. Yeah, no, perfect. And it's so interesting that you all say this. So one of my schoolmates, Maurice Mander, has just completed a full-length animated movie about black superheroes. And all the black superheroes represent HBCUs. So there's a Morehouse brother, Spellman sister, um, a wonderful movie. I must say, I did one of the voiceovers in the trailer. And it's brilliantly done. His major at Morehouse was history. He was a history major. And so it's definitely available here. The beautiful thing about being in this place is so many creative minds exist and so many students with multiple, you know, uh, interests that they curate and motivate themselves to develop into better artists while they're here. So, of course, this is always done. We do have digital work done. Um, students know so much more about this information than, than you can imagine. They do it. They bring it to me. They show it to me. I'm amazed. Sometimes I'm I'm overwhelmed by it. Oh my God, aren't you a English major? Yes, but this is my side interest. I have a student who's graduating right now. He's a physics and English major. He has similar aspirations. Um, another student, a friend of mine, he was a philosophy major. Now he makes video games. Right. So again, it's not just the classroom. I never want you to reduce your learning to the classroom. Always understand this is an environment that's conducive to you imagining and creating and developing in ways that I think is unique to Morehouse. We really do push each other and we assist each other in that in that regard. Love it. Love it. Love it. We have an amazing question. Someone says, look, I'm very interested in the business program at Morehouse. And I would like to know how are the business students supported at Morehouse? Morehouse? And also, how is tutoring handled? Uh, tutoring, I'll start with that. We have multiple areas of tutoring. We have general tutoring in the Frederick Douglass Academic Center. So you go in, and that's in the center of um, the campus. You go in, you sign up for what respective area you need assistance in. We also do cohort or peer tutoring. We will locate students in your area who have shown themselves to have great facility with the topic, and we'll match you with them. We also have the Black Ink Project, which is focused on writing. Writing is a fundamental part of the curriculum in Morehouse, and the Morehouse curriculum tries its best to focus on Black lives, experiences, and its history and culture. So that is an ear, I mean, that is fundamentally a staple in Morehouse, that the Black Ink Project, every class at Morehouse is supposed to etch out space to discuss and to engage Black life, history, and culture. And that writing institute is a brilliant one read, um, led by Dr. Norman, who's here at Morehouse College. And so you do have a lot of tutoring. Business majors have overwhelming support because most of the students at Morehouse, I think the largest number of majors is in the area of business, including accounting, marketing, management, finance. So they have, one could argue, their own facility, which we call the leadership building. So they have uh, courses or instruction on interviewing, on how to dress, uh, what types of internships are available are always no, made known to them. We also have career placement. Um, Douglas Cooper runs that. And again, it's not reducible to business majors, but other individuals. So for example, 
our SGA president, who was a philosophy major, worked for, um, oh my God, who's that on Wall Street? Was it Morgan? I think Morgan. it was Morgan. Yep. He worked for them this summer. Um, so again, the opportunities are available uh, and they're always available. I, I've never seen a lack of opportunity. And so the support is always here. But again, because we're a small liberalized college, you don't have to get in line to receive very particular contextual support. That means that it's not general support, it's support that you specifically need after you've been in conversation with an advisor. Love it, love it, love it. And that's that support is, is important. You know, we got this question on mistakes. What are some of the mistakes that students should avoid when choosing a major? Oh, well, I think we've said it slightly here, and that is don't choose a major to be the one-to-one -one correspondence with what you think you want to do in the future. Choose something you care about. And the reason that becomes a problem is because once you take some of the general ed courses and realize that you missed your so-called calling, and now you're a junior, part of our attrition is associated with people changing their majors late in their game. And parents who are watching, you know you're not happy to hear that he's been doing three years in one discipline and he finally took a course in a general ed and realized that animates him. That's his thing. And now he wants to change his major. And now he has to backtrack to catch up in courses. So that is a major problem here. So that's why I tell students one of the best approaches is um, non-declared major. I mean, be open. And if you declare a major, be open to changing it. So freshman year, during freshman orientation, as I told you, meets every Tuesday. Part of our responsibility is to force the students to think actively, proactively about what is it that you're trying to do? What is the major that you think you want? Research it. Don't allow yourself to be the only knowledge base from which you decide your major. Do the research. What types of possibilities exist for you in this major? Some majors are more broadly construed, like mathematics, like physics, like philosophy, history, and English. Those are very general in ways you can go from medical school, law school, graduate school, Wall Street, international affairs, anything you want from those majors. Because they're going to be very broadly um, construed and they're going to cover so many areas from quantitative to qualitative. Absolutely. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. Love it. Well, look, we're at time. Um, I want to make sure that um, everyone knows that Professor Davis is a wealth of knowledge. Um, we are so thankful to have him on this platform and what you've already done, Doc. I'll let you lead uh, in with closing remarks and make a couple of announcements. So the first thing is early decision for all our students uh, who know they want to come to Morehouse. We ask that you would uh, apply early decision, right? Uh, Professor Davis, Morehouse was your only choice, right? I'm sorry, say it again. I said Morehouse was your only choice. Like you didn't apply anywhere else. Yeah. Well, see, they're not going to like to hear this. So uh, I played a lot of basketball and I thought I was going to go to college to play basketball. And my mother, along with my sister, who attended Clark College and the honors program, told me I must attend Morehouse. Um, you can imagine going other places, but you will attend Morehouse. So it was the only one by virtue of my compliance with my mother and her, in her prescience to say, you will be more out. And interesting, interestingly enough, Michael, the issue for her was, and I love it, she had seen what Morehouse had done for others. She never attended college, but mm -hmm. what she, her position was, I've seen what it has done, and I want that done to my son. That was her position. I've seen it. And so as far as she was concerned, you will have that done to you. And that's how I ended up at Morehouse. And wow, I'm back here teaching. Look at that. Look at that. Well, and I can say uh, it was the only school I applied to. <laughs> uh, and and there was no, um, I, I think we both have no regrets. So early decision, apply by November 1st, and you'll get your decision by December the 5th. Okay. That is binding. So we want to make sure that you know very well in advance what that means as you make your decision, make your choice. The second announcement I want to make is the one dealing with open house. Um, you know, kick the dirt, see the players, engage with professors like Professor Ilya Davis, and really see what Morehouse has to offer. We are offering this amazing opportunity on November the 11th, and we want you to come to our campus. We want you to uh, sign up and register, so we'll make sure you have the link. It will be sent to you. 
and we want you to be a part of this amazingness at Morehouse College. Um, we are five minutes over, but Doc, I want you to end with the words uh, that that uh, really help them uh, understand what choosing major is all about, and just kind of summarizing everything that you that you talked with us today. Briefly, when I started Morehouse College, I was an accounting major. And it wasn't until I took Introduction to Philosophy by Aaron Parker, who is still a professor here at Morehouse. He graduated Morehouse class of 75. The way that he engaged me as a person with the respect and the dignity I believe all human beings deserve fundamentally led me to change my major to philosophy. Does that happen to everyone? No. But I was fortunate enough to meet myself in that class. I could be honest with myself and scrutinize myself. So when you all decide on your majors, it's not a simple thing. Don't assume that you will take one class or read one book or hear one lecture. This is a life process because what you're saying is, I am going to do this as a matter of who I am versus what I will do. It's not about what you would do as much as the kind of person you become. I don't care what your major is at the end of the day, but you should always say to yourself, is this making me better? Is it giving me a sense of my value in the world and how I will contribute to humanity? If your major does that, do it. If you don't see it happening, get out, right? Because it's about cultivating our humanity, creating a better world, more equitable, loving, and caring world. That's how you choose a major. Is this doing this? Am I going to see myself doing this as a part of who I am? It constitutes me as a human being. That's what's important. There you have it. Well, everyone have a wonderful evening. Uh, let your work be so impressive that the committee of selection will be compelled to examine your credentials. Work hard. We're here to help. We're here to assist. Come see our campus. Come talk to Professor Davis. You might see him on Brown Street <laughs> and engaging with students. So we're so happy that you all were able to join us. Have a wonderful evening.